today we're going to concentrate on what Erwin and his team have been doing in France. We've been to Spain. We went to Barcelona uh, in the first one of these spotlights. We then went over to Melbourne. And now we've come this side of the Pyrenees to Bordeaux. Uh, and I thought we'd start off, Erwin, by just, if you just sort of introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about, you know, where you trained, how you ended up in Parkinson's disease research, or was this a burning passion that you've had since the age of five or, or whatever? <laughs> not, uh, not, not exactly. Also, uh, my uh, grand grandmother was affected by uh, by Parkinsonism. Uh, I can't say if she was suffering from Parkinson's disease because it was in the thirties, and uh, she might have suffered from a Parkinsonism uh, following the uh, the great uh, flu epidemic during the twenties in uh, in Europe. Anyway. So I've been uh, I've been trained in uh, in Bordeaux. So I'm still in Bordeaux, but I've been trained in the first place in, uh, in Bordeaux. I did my PhD on Parkinson's disease in Bordeaux, working with Christian Gross and Bernard Bulac, who uh, have been deeply involved into the development and discovery of deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus for improving the Parkinsonian symptoms. Uh, I've then done a postdoc. Uh, stay in Manchester in the UK, so um, not too far, uh, but <laughs> working with uh, Anne Crossman uh, and Jonathan Bocci uh, before John moved to, uh, to Canada. And then I went uh, back to, to France and I got a position uh, at the, in 2001 or two. Okay, so, so basically your, your entire research career has really been on aspects of Parkinson's disease. And we're, we're going we're gonna to come on and talk about that because not only do you work on Parkinson's, but the, you, as we'll discuss, we have this slightly controversial area of some of the animal models that you use, which, which you know, obviously some people have different views on it, but, but we can discuss the merits of that. But, but essentially, this has been your passion, has been trying to understand Parkinson's your entire research career. Yeah, and various aspects of the uh, of the disease. In the first place, I was I was working on the compensatory mechanism, basically the neurobiology uh, that is uh, responsible for the late appearance of uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So why do Parkinson's di disease uh, appear at the age of fifty five or or sixty? Why does it take ten years before to be uh, to be detected? So and there are mechanism at work uh, that are responsible for this. And then I moved um, to the understanding of the pathophysiology of levodopa induced dyskinesia. Okay. Because, uh, we, or we, when I say we, I mean the community uh, had developed uh, extremely valuable animal models of levodopa induced dyskinesia in rodents, but also in non-human primates. Uh, that were and that have been valuable uh, to understand this uh, pathophysiology. And then I met uh, Benjamin uh, Dehay, uh, who uh, very interestingly and, and funnily enough uh, was doing his uh, postdoc with uh, Miguel Villa in Barcelona. So mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a link with, uh, okay. with your first... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, when I met uh, Benjamin, Benjamin was, uh, you, you will explain later, but uh, was working since years uh, for understanding the mechanisms of cell death in neurodegenerative disorders. Okay. And uh, with uh, Benjamin and Miguel in the first place, uh, I decided to, to slightly switch my interest and try to understand the mechanisms leading to, to cell death. And I didn't do that before because I didn't want to use the neurotoxin for understanding which were classically used in the, in the past. Uh, I found the models uh, not irrelevant, but not perfectly relevant. And uh, the development of synuclein-based models, including the use of Lewy bodies, as we have done uh, since, uh, seem to be far more relevant to the understanding of what's going on in the brain of, uh, of PD patient. And uh, Benjamin then moved to, uh, to Bordeaux, and we basically uh, uh, grew up the thematic uh, around the uh, northern generation in, in Bordeaux 10 years ago when, uh, when Benjamin joined and, uh, and we developed. Okay. 
So, so your interest in Parkes initially was on sort of compensation. Why does it take so long for us to develop Parkes? And if there's this whole period it takes, you know, by the time you present, you've lost 50% of your dopamine cells, any percent of your fibers. But obviously, when you've lost 40%, you still seem to be all right. So, so that was the first one. Then, then you worked on to that. I suppose linked to that is that that is a what we'd call plasticity changes in the brain, and presumably similar mechanisms might underlie what goes wrong when you take L-DOPA for lots of times, that, that, that induces some changes which are initially helpful and then unhelpful and you develop the dyskinesias. But now you've gone right back and said, what causes it in the first place? So, so let's move over to Benjamin. So Benjamin, uh, I think you did your PhD with Anne Bertolotti, who is of course a colleague of mine here in Cambridge. In fact, she emailed me this morning about uh, uh, something in Huntington's disease, not Parkinson's disease. And, and then you worked with uh, Michael Villa, as we were just hearing, uh, this, who uh, uh, was talking about the black stuff, so neuromelanin and the nigra. And now you're in Bordeaux, where you've converted Irwin from plasticity to pathogenesis. What goes wrong in Parkinson's disease? So tell us a little bit about your background. So, uh, as you said, so I did my PhD with Anne Bertolotti uh, in Paris, where I studied uh, uh, Huntington aggregation. So, in different uh, in vitro models, in yeast, and uh, in cellular models. And then I wanted to, to change a little bit and to see what's going on in Parkinson's disease. And uh, I had the chance to, to meet uh, Michael Villa, and I wanted also to move my topic and to understand the mechanism of cell deaths uh, involved in Parkinson's disease. So I stayed uh, three years in, Bast in Barcelona with, uh, with Miguel. And then uh, I met uh, Erwan during a meeting in 2009 and uh, explained to me that uh, he wanted to, to move the topic and I was interested to come back in France. So I, 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 I came uh, in Bordeaux and then I obtained a tenure position uh, right. 2013, and then I am still working on the mechanism of cell death and the modulation of the autophagy pathway as a therapeutic strategy and the synuclein modeling. So that's why my background. Okay, well, that's very interesting. So actually meeting at a meeting, can we believe it, physical meetings? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, this wasn't an arranged meeting. You just you just started chatting and out of that came this new conversation and this new line of of research so i mean it makes a very good point about the value of meetings people often say well they don't have any value because we're just hearing everything everyone said before but actually you meet you have these conversations offline and out of that come new areas yeah. of research yeah so that's great so so marie laurie i don't know if i pronounced your name correctly uh probably not uh but do <clears throat> correct me and because you've got uh, a bit of an interesting past you wouldn't i wouldn't naturally associate you with Parkinson's disease based on what i was reading more of an engineer, is that right? Or have I got that wrong? So yes, I started uh, by uh, uh, bioengineering school uh, in Nice, uh, in the, at the University of Nice, which is in the southeast of France. Uh, and I learned the uh, basic uh, knowledge, uh, multidisciplinary uh, bi uh, approaches in biology in the bioengineering school, and I had the opportunity during this process to uh, to join the team of Erwan Bezar as an intern. And after this internship in the team of Erwan Bezar under the supervision of Benjamin, I decided to pursue with a, a PhD. So I started my PhD in the team um, in 2016. Um, and the, my PhD work was focused on uh, the study of synuclein in general. Um, uh, one axis was uh, focused on determining the mechanisms uh, um, involved uh, in the neurodegeneration and the alpha synuclein pathology uh, presenting in the synucleinopathies, including Parkinson's disease, and uh, using the non human primate model of Parkinson's disease uh, we're going to talk about. And uh, a second axis was more focused on um, the restoration of the lysosomal, uh, the autophagy lysosomal pathway. Uh, so more therapeutic uh, uh, translational research. And uh, after this, I was lucky to obtain a um, one-year postdoctoral fellowship from France Parkinson uh, Association. So I pushed my work with uh, Benjamin and Juan here at Bordeaux. And six months ago, I had the great opportunity to stay in the team as a research engineer 
and so I, uh, I am currently working uh, on senior clinical practice with the different collaborators in the team. So, so okay. this uh, field of science just catch me uh, in a certain way. So. Well, that's great. So that's how you all came together as a team. Now, you keep telling us all about this thing called alpha synuclein or alpha synucleinopathies. Uh, and obviously, some of us know what that means. And I would have thought most people on the call know what that means. But but uh, I mean, when I was growing up, and I'm older than all of you, uh, I mean, alpha synuclein never heard of it. And when Stan was starting, uh, you know, we'd never heard of alpha synuclein. I mean, that. so what is alpha synuclein? And why should we be interested in it? So uh, alpha synuclein came from the discovery that uh, there is some mutations in the gene uh, entitled alpha synuclein. And there is some familial forms of Parkinson's disease based on alpha synuclein mutations or alpha synuclein uh, increase of expression, so alpha synuclein duplication or triplication. So it was discovered uh, more than 20 years ago now. And uh, so this was the start of a huge uh, effort to understand the role of alpha uh in Parkinson's disease pathophysiology. So in the context of familial disease or sporadic forms of Parkinson's disease. And after we identified that uh, uh, the presence of alpha synuclein aggregates in the brains of post-mortem patients and also in other uh, uh, you know, the systems as a peripheral nervous system or the enteric nervous system. So it was really the beginning of the link between alpha so, so in the 90s, there were these familial cases, so genetic, rare genetic forms of Parkinson's, which, which had alpha synuclein abnormalities in it, which, which led to the patients developing Parkinson's. And then, from what I've understood, you were saying that it was then discovered that in people who died with Parkinson's who didn't have a family history, no genetic cause for it, they had alpha synuclein as well. So it wasn't just found in rare families. It seemed to be in the presence of the brains of everyone with, with Parkinson's. So I suppose the question that flows from that is, is it only found in the brains of people with Parkinson's or is alpha synuclein something we all possess? Do we all need alpha synuclein and it goes wrong in Parkinson's or is it something new that arises in Parkinson's? Oh, absolutely, you're right. I mean, everyone has synuclein, and it's one of the most abundant protein into the synapses. So the small element that allows the communication between two neurons into the brain. So most neurons into the brain, everywhere into the brain, they do express synuclein, and uh, in quite large quantities. And most of the time, it is well handled by the uh, by the neurons and also by the uh, glial cells. And in some people, and we don't know why, we have absolutely no clue why, in some people, uh, it starts aggregating. So forming small clumps that basically uh, lead to progressively to the impairment of the functioning of the neuron and relatively possibly to the death of the neurons after some time. Some neurons die, some neurons do not die, but they clearly dysfunction. And uh, after some time, and I say some time because we don't know how long, but uh, uh, some people develop Parkinson's disease, some develop will, will develop multiple system atrophy, some others might develop dementia with memory body and various forms of those uh, different conditions. So, so this is a normal protein, which is vital for cells to communicate, although we don't quite know exactly what its function is. But then it goes wrong for some reason in people with Parkinson's and related disorders, if I've understood it. So multiple system atrophy, dementia with Lewy bodies, Parkinson's dementia, all of these have what we call an alpha synucleinopathy. So, so it goes wrong in people with Parkinson's. So this sort of brings us on to your research. So, so one argument would be when well, it goes wrong in people with Parkinson's because the cell itself starts misbehaving, the it can't get rid of the protein, the protein accumulates, and that's it. So this is a disease which just sort of randomly affects cells, and that's that. But I mean, Erwin and your your team have sort of taken on this whole idea that that it's not as simple as that, or or it's not that's the whole story. That this may be a disease where it starts in one place and sp and spreads to other places. Absolutely. And I mean, this idea uh, is not from us. I mean, others have had uh, this idea and uh, one of the first to, uh, to spread the idea, if I may <laughs> uh, 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 the German pathologist who, uh, as early uh, as uh, 2003, uh, uh, 
uh, by studying the uh, brains of uh, many people, including Parkinson patients, uh, found out that uh, there was a sort of uh, progression into the presence of pathology in the brain. So when he, he, he took a very large collection of brains and he found out that uh, uh, was pretty, or the beginning of pathologies might start into the brainstem and then progressively invade the brain, ending up into the cerebral cortex. So there was a sort of uh, of pathway for the uh, for the progression of the disease. And then I think the the next breaking point was uh, 2007 2008. Three papers came out. Um, and they were studying the uh, brains of diseased uh, PD patients who had been grafted with the mesencephalic embryonic uh, dopaminergic neurons. Uh, and some cases had been grafted 14 years before their, before their death. And 14 years later, then, uh, the grafted neurons, so the young neurons into the relatively old brains, they, some of those neurons were harboring Levy body. So the classic anatomopathological landmark of Parkinson's disease, which is full of synuclein, not simply synuclein, but full of synuclein, of aggregated synuclein. So the idea came therefore that maybe Eichelbrack was uh, right, and maybe there was a spreading capability of these aggregates. And then uh, a number of labs uh, all over the world start to, uh, to, to work on, uh, on the idea. I mean, I, I cannot cite uh, everyone, but yeah. uh, Virginia Lee in the US uh, has been extremely instrumental. Maria Gracias in London uh, also, uh, who was uh, uh, one of the first authors of the very first paper linking synuclein and Parkinson. She also worked on the, on the equation. So, we, so, can I, so, can, so can I, just a couple of questions I wanted to ask you, so I've got it clear in my mind. Uh, you talk about synuclein and you talk about Lewy bodies. Are they the same thing? And then, and then, if I've so perhaps we'll answer that question first, and then I just want to come back to a point you made about BRAC and then this spread. So, 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 are Lewy bodies and alpha synuclein the same thing, or, or? the Lewy body is a is a is a structure that appears in cells, in living cells, and it's a sort of a, you can you can consider it as a trash bin of all aggregates and small parts of the cells that are not uh, digested by the cell. They right. should be digested, but they are not for some reason, it's part of the pathology, and uh, they end up into this uh, structure that we call Lewy bodies from the name of the German pathologist uh, Lewy from the, uh, from the 20s. And uh, uh, Lewy bodies, they do contain silicon, of course, and uh, uh, classically we, uh, we detect them or we see them uh, with stains, but also with antibodies specific for, for silicon, for instance. But in fact, uh, uh, the most recent uh, studies that have uh, carefully looked at the components of the bodies, they have uh, identified up to, up to 800, 1,000 different proteins into the living. Right. So we cannot say aggregation of silicon and the body is the same, no. So the body okay. is composed of silicon and many other things. Okay, and I and I guess we'll come back on to this because, of course, the Lewy bodies you see in the brain of people who've died with Parkinson's, and I guess the question is, are those Lewy bodies triggered by the alpha synuclein in the first place, or is it everything in the Lewy body? So, coming to your experiments, which we'll discuss in a, in a while, you know, should we, is is the spread of alpha synuclein the whole story, or is it the spread of the Lewy body 800 protein mixture, which may be may be more potent? But but we'll we'll come back to that. So. And the second point I'm just trying to get, so Heike brought stained the brains and showed that there was pathology in different sites. And then the argument would be, if I've understood your argument correctly, this spread and also in these young dopamine cells in the transplants, that the synuclein has come from one site, one cell in the body. It passes through the synapse, we're saying, or through some mechanism between connecting cells. And once it gets into that new cell, over time, it causes that cell to develop an alpha synuclein aggregate, a Lewy body. So in the transplant, these young dopamine cells have been infected by alpha synuclein from the Parkinson's brain and triggered pathology in that cell. Is, is, so that is that the sort of mechanism we're, we're thinking about here? Absolutely that. And that's, uh, again, that's even the, the concept of an uh, infectious protein. So that, therefore the aggregated, uh, aggregated synuclein is an infectious protein. 
Okay. So that obviously makes us a bit anxious because you know if something's infectious can we all get infected by it so so in the uk for example uh, probably more than i would say in france 20 years ago actually when alpha synuclein was first <laughs> described uh, as associated with poxies there was uh, this new variant creutzfeldt jakob disease new variant cjd which is caused by this prion protein which was thought to come from infected cattle so the idea there was you ate infected meat the meat contain the protein, it infected you, you then developed the disease. The vast majority of people obviously didn't. So is that is that what you're saying happens in Pogsies or is this it's it, it's there's no evidence that we can catch it from the environment or or how does the infective element fit into that sort of story? Well uh, if I had the answer, I mean I would want the yeah. Nobel Prize. Uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know the answer and I think I think nobody does. We might have a number of hypotheses. What we know is that uh, it is infectious, yes. Uh, is it really, um, it is a strong infectious uh, uh, agent? No, I mean, clearly, uh, clearly not. And uh, in order to get the aggregation into the first place, there are a number of events that need to take place. And possibly uh, uh, there are multiple ways of uh, obtaining aggregation of cyclin and uh, what we call idiot or sporadic Parkinson's disease, or the uh, patient suffering from a idiopathic Parkinson's disease or unknown cause, they might have uh, had a disease that has started for multiple reasons. Combination of, uh, of a certain susceptibility for developing Parkinson's disease uh, together with an inflammation, with, a, with an exposure to specific agent in the food or into the environment, and we don't know which one, of course or other events, and suddenly in one part of their nervous system, aggregation starts to take place. Once it has started, however, then there is a process, as you have described, of uh, spreading, involving uh, one cell, two cells, and so on, but very slow and progressive. So it's not aggressive, it's very, very slow, it's progressive. Even in, uh, in conditions like uh, multiple system atrophy, which evolves much more rapidly than Parkinson's disease, it takes time. Okay. So I guess, you know, obviously age is a factor here, coming back to where you began with your research, you know, these compensatory mechanisms and aging is important. So so if we sort of follow this argument through that 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 once it starts, it started and it will spread. I guess I guess the next question that arises is, well, when do you think it starts and where do you think it starts? And this obviously leads to some of your experimental work because I guess one of the problems with with doing studies in patients if you like is is we're just fixed with what we've got we we can we can make we can say well lots of people had problems with smell or constipation uh, before they develop Parkinson's but is that the beginning of it well we don't know because we can't really do those type of experiments so so it where it, it, within your team I mean where do you think this disease begins do you think it begins in one site and if so when and uh, how long before people present yeah I, I believe that we are you have three people in front of you and we have three different answers <laughs> so, my answer first and then uh, then we, we have done in order to, to address some of the some of the concern um i don't think there is one place where it can start and uh, i think that also uh, the world field is sometimes uh, classic in science, but uh, is misled by the first demonstration. So the seminal hypothesis uh, elaborated by Eiko Brack has been extremely insightful and it's a fantastic hypothesis. But uh, uh, the most recent uh, uh, studies have shown that 50% uh, of the cases uh, of Parkinson's disease uh, do not match with the uh, uh, Brack staging um, system that he has proposed. Uh, since uh, the hypothesis of Brack was maybe it was starting into the arteric nervous system, basically into the gut, into the stomach, mm -hmm. in intestines, somewhere, and uh, somewhere into the gut. And uh, a number of, uh, of teams have done uh, biopsies of the, uh, of the gut and they have found uh, indeed uh, aggregates of alpha synuclein, the same into the, uh, into the skin, uh, into the uh, mucosa of the, of the nose and so on. Uh, I am not sure that we can 
defined for all Parkinson's patients that it has started somewhere. I'm pretty sure that it can start in many different places. And, and maybe there are subtypes of Parkinson's that uh, we are not able yet to identify, but subtypes that will correspond to different trajectories of, uh, of spraying of initiation of the disease. Maybe we can elaborate on what we have done. Yes. So just before, just before you say, I'm just going to, uh, as uh, by all means, send in questions. So people, uh, you know, I'm obviously asking all the questions, moment, but people, people in the audience, do put your questions in the chat. Uh, sorry, carry on, Marie. So we wanted to test the to test the hypothesis of the initiation of the pathology into the enteric nervous system. So we used our uh, uh, primate model of Parkinson disease. Uh, so we purified uh, alpha synuclein and rich fraction, uh, purified from uh, Parkinson's disease brain patients, and um, patient brain. And after uh, we injected this alpha synuclein and rich fraction into the the gastric wall of the non-human remains, and uh, what we found is that uh, we uh, induce the alpha synuclein pathology propagation from the enteric nervous system into the brain of the animals. So meaning we, conf we confirm the hypothesis that maybe we will have a codorostral propagation of the alpha synuclein pathology from the enteric nervous system into the central nervous system. Which so, so, you so you can do this in that, because obviously in people, you could say, well, they've got pathology in the gut and they get pathology in the brain but they may get those independently. In your experiments, these non-human primates, these monkeys never develop alpha synuclein pathology in the brain. So you inject them in the gut, goes into the nerve cells in the gut, or goes into the gut wall, and then it ends up giving them a pathology in the brain. Okay. Exactly, and it, uh, it also induces uh, neurodegeneration with the uh, uh, dopamine fiber loss in the striatum, for example, on some characteristic like this of neurodegeneration in the brain. So uh, we... So, so just so, so that's very interesting. So you inject it in the gut. Yes. But the pathology you see in the brain is the pathology you'd see in Poxies. It doesn't just go to the bits of the brain connected to the gut. No. Okay, interesting. Because so, that's what you'd expect. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. And it was a uh, uh, surprise also to see that, uh, for example, the level of neurodegeneration we can assess in the animals which were injected into the gut uh, was completely similar of the animals which received the same friction but into the brain. So you had the same level of neurodegeneration when you, whatever the site of injection in the animal. Uh, so that if you inject it under the skin, would you see the same thing, do you think? We don't know. <laughs> no, we don't. And the so other... whether you inject it in the gut or the brain, you end up with the same pathology. Yeah. Okay. In both places. Yeah. yeah. In both places, yes. Meaning that when we injected uh, in the spider of the animals, we were also able to see alpha synuclein pathology, which uh, have been uh, has been developed into the gut. Yeah. So the bidirectional propagation of the alpha synuclein pathology we have observed in this study. So and it can go from the gut to the brain and the brain to the gut. And that was the more appealing result uh, in the study. The codostral, the, yeah, sorry, the ostrocodal propagation of alpha synuclein pathology in uh, our model. And, and how long did that take to develop? <laughs> how long? Three years after injection. Yeah. So we have, yes, we have terminated the animals three years after the injection, but we don't know. We don't have a time point before two years. So we don't no, know. But, 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 this, but this, this, this takes months. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and did you say two years before yeah. you saw it? Yeah. So, so that raises another question for me, which is a slight diversion. But, but obviously, there'll be people listening to this who, who will. You know, this is non-human primates. This is monkey experiments, and you know, people have different views on this. Uh, and I know you've done lots of fantastic work in this particular model system, both with the dyskinesias, as you were talking about earlier, and this. Now, obviously, for for a pathology develop over two years in a rodent, so a mouse or a rat, 
they would actually be dead at two years. So, so you wouldn't actually see it. So uh, it, it'd be useful just to sort of have a sort of, a, a, just a thought about what do, what do the non-human primates bring to the study that you just couldn't get from any other system apart from this, you know, two years? Because I think some of your work, if I've understood it correctly, shows that you get pathology in, in non-human primates, which you just would never see over any time frame in rodents but you do see it in humans so this is actually a very valuable system because there are things we will learn from it that we can't learn from any other route is that would that be a fair summary yeah, it is a fair summary i mean uh, uh, the timing the duration of the experiment is uh, is clearly a, a factor but uh, we don't believe it is a key differential factor between rodents and, and primates why we use primates it's because uh, as you know we call the uh, substance nigra, the black substance, just because it is black in aged patients, or in, yeah. uh, not in, uh, in their brain, but in my brain or in your brain, it's uh, certainly gray and uh, or, or black. And uh, when the pathologist uh, look at the substance nigra, uh, the first diagnosis uh, or post-mortem diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is because the substance nigra becomes pale. So, and this, Black pigment is due to the accumulation of neuromelanin, and you've been talking about neuromelanin with, with Miguel. And uh, but neuromelanin is, as Miguel explained, specific of primates, specific of uh, notably of uh, of us, of human beings, and um, it's part of the physiology of the dopamine neurons. And the work of Miguel has demonstrated recently that when you uh, express or when you confer the capability of uh, the rat dopamine neurons to express neuromelanin, they become uh, susceptible to degeneration as they age. And we believe that uh, such differences between primates and rodents might explain this specific susceptibility of primate human dopamine neurons to die because of various sets of insults, including the presence of aggregated nucleus. But it's not simply the differences in uh, in microphysiology or specific set of neurons in uh, in primates compared to to rodents. Just because of the size, uh, the already amazing uh, arborization of uh, dopamine neurons in the rodent brain is even more amazing in in primates than in human beings. So it makes those tiny neurons the neurons. Uh, which has the almost the, the biggest arborization and therefore which are the most uh, um, susceptible to uh, or sensible to subtle variation into the energy load because they are working full speed constantly. And uh, if they are deprived of anything, they become dysfunctional and they, uh, they basically uh, die. Okay. Primate, they also have a, a differential proportion of neurons versus glial cells. And uh, because monkeys are closer to human beings than, uh, than rats, uh, the proportion of glial cells versus neurons is the same in, uh, in monkeys and humans compared to rodents. And as you know, the role of inflammation and of uh, non-autonomous uh, mechanism leading to cell death are particularly important. And therefore, this species is uh, of particular, particularly relevant to, to study those uh, mechanisms. Not speaking, of course, about the uh, the behavioral repertoire, which is uh, closer to human beings. And uh, the Parkinson monkey is really a Parkinson monkey. A Parkinson yeah. rat is not Parkinson. It is exhibiting a number of behaviors that are relevant to Parkinson's disease, but not uh, comparable to a Parkinson symptom. Okay. So, so just a little plug for our next one of these spotlights, we're talking about inflammation in Pugsy. So thank you for bringing that up, Owen. That was a, a nice segue into that. But but just so, I, so you were mentioning earlier, for example, you didn't like the toxin models. So, so basically what you're trying to model is as faithfully as possible that which occurs in the naturally in the human condition. So, so the the complexity of a, a non-human primate brain is much closer, obviously, to the complexity of our brain. The cells look much more like it, both in terms of how big they are, how much they send out fibers, what they contain. Uh, the time scale is obviously important, and and also I think you were saying that that because alpha synuclein sits at the center of the disease it makes much more sense to model the disease with alpha synuclein than with toxins to kill things, which are obviously very artificial and probably have nothing to do with the human condition. So that's, 
So that's very interesting. I've got a few questions that are coming in, but but before we get to that, I just want so we just sort of finish off how your work has developed. So so your theory is that that the alpha synuclein, wherever it comes into the system or wherever it goes wrong, ends up causing problems in the same place. And do we know what type of alpha synuclein causes that problem? Do we do we recognise what that is? And 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 I suppose the question which links to that is why are some cells very susceptible to it and others not? Which I would suspect is a slightly harder question to answer. <laughs> so uh, so it's uh, hard to be questions. So now we know that there is a, a lot of. Uh, alpha synuclein spaces, uh, which can be formed and created uh, inside of the cell. So there is different hypotheses. So we know that uh, it's a dynamic process, the alpha synuclein aggregation. So there is different spaces starting from the oligomers, the protofibrils, the fibrils, and finally the amyloid fibers. So depending of the experimental models, depending of the cells, uh, there is no consensus uh, in the field. There is a lot of evidence that oligomers, small alpha synuclein aggregates, mm. uh, meaning alpha synuclein oligomers, can be more um, toxic because they can make uh, deleterious consequences inside of the cell because of they are smaller. So they can uh, create some uh, disturbances into the membrane of the cells, into the mitochondria, into the lysosomes. Uh, it can also um, create some dysfunction in the protein uh, folding. So there is no consensus, as I said, but we, most of the people think that so maybe small alpha synuclein aggregates can be more toxic than the big one as the big bodies or fibrils. But so, 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 so the alpha synuclein changes in some way into some. So there are different types of alpha synuclein, and then they all get aggregated into a Lewy body. But, but there are these small proteins, these oligomeric forms of it, and then there are these small aggregates. And, and, and you, and I think your experiments have clearly shown this. These look to be the most toxic. Yeah. The most toxic. And, and so one of the questions we've got is, you, you know, well, what, what causes that? So we, we're sort of going back and we've got to that. So what was that? So one of the questions is, you know, could the virus trigger the disease coming back to your, you know, your grandmother, Owen, you know, you know, did she with encephalitis uh, lethargica or Spanish flu? And at the last uh, uh, spotlight we had, we were talking a little bit about whether COVID might predispose people to this. So, so what triggers that initial problem? Do we, do we know what that might be? That, that change in the sort of species, if you like, of alpha-synuclein? We, we, we don't know exactly what is causing that, but uh, what is pretty clear now is that uh, uh, synuclein can adopt different shapes. And those different shapes, the shapes of the aggregate, uh, will lead to a different uh, uh, pattern of uh, pathology and pattern of degeneration. It's quite striking that, uh, I mean, there are many people in the world working with uh, what we call recombinant synuclein. So it's basically uh, artificial synuclein. So we synthesize it uh, thanks mm -hmm. to bacteria and uh, you have the, the full length uh, synuclein. So it's a uh, long protein. And uh, you leave it uh, on the bench in various tubes. And uh, if you have 10 tubes, uh, you might have uh, 10 different shapes of aggregate. Mm -hmm. So the spectrum of shapes it can take is really huge and large. And into the literature now, there are a large number of, uh, of what we call species, so the, the shapes uh, that are well characterized, but they have different behaviors. And clearly when you inject them uh, into cells or into the brain of animals, they have different behaviors and they lead to different types of degeneration which might be the source and the explanation for the different types of disease the patient eventually uh, develop. But we don't know what is driving toward a specific shape in the first place. We know that it can be replicated once it has started, but what is the primum moment, the first event we don't know. Okay. 
So, so we're not clear what triggers it. And, and then it, it basically you get different species of alpha cyanucleins, some of which are more toxic than others. And those different ones cause different disease. So a different form of alpha cyanucleins would cause multiple system atrophy, would call Parkinson's disease, possibly dementia with Lewy bodies. So, so we sort of, so the theory is very nice. So we've, we've sort of, Heike Brock said, we've got all these different areas. You're saying actually this is because alpha cyanucleins changes at one of these sites. And then once it's changed in the gut or the brain, uh, it, it then can spread to other sites. So how much do we know about the mechanism of spread? And then what does that mean therapeutically? Because, because for a simple person like me, if something's spreading, I should better stop it spreading by killing it off with a vaccine or things like that, which is obviously very topical at the moment, vaccines. Uh, so, so how does it spread? Do we know how it spreads? Is it all by nerve to nerve? Does it go via the bloodstream? Does it creep up on other uh, processes within the body? How, how, how do we think it spreads? And then what does that mean therapeutically? So, uh, so it is still an open question. So there is a lot of hypothesis to understand how alpha synuclein can move from a cell to another. So uh, alpha synuclein can, uh, can go out of the cells and be uptaken by another cell by passive uh, um, transport, or there is also the, the hypothesis that maybe uh, it exists some receptors uh, in the membrane of the neurons to be okay. able to, to enter into the cells. Uh, there is also the, the blood flow, which can be also a pathway uh, to, 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 for the alpha synuclein to move from one organ to another or from the gut to the brain. So there is a multiple uh, hypothesis, but there is no definitive answers to, to, to really to understand and to <coughs> propose therapeutics. So there is a uh, base on the mechanism we can expect to, to for uh, immunization. The so meaning mm -hmm. if a thinking is present in the blood or outside of the cell, with maybe with an antibody, uh, target, we can target alpha synuclein and uh, try to remove the toxic alpha synuclein aggregates outside of the cell to, to clear uh, the body and the organ to avoid any uh, infection. Okay. But it's still ongoing and we don't measure the, the, the mechanism by itself. So we need first to understand the mechanism to adapt. Yeah, the concept the concept is simple but the consequences are quite large because we previously said that there are many spaces okay there are many spaces but then how do we design the antibodies yeah. and are the antibodies capable of reaching the brain when they are injected into the bloodstream uh, once they are into the brain alpha synuclein is an ultra similar protein meaning it is within the cell and as benjamin was saying it might travel from one cell to another cell to another cell, but during a short period of time. So mm. are the antibodies capturing alpha synuclein when it travels, or do, they, do the antibodies have to enter into the cell in order to remove the aggregate? So there are a number of if, but we don't know yet, and that are complexifying the, uh, the question. Yeah. So, so what do we target our antibody against? And even if we know what to target against, how do we know it's going to get to where it needs to work? And and then I guess the other worry I would have, Erwin, is that, as you were saying at the beginning, that, that we have a lot of alpha synuclein in our brain, which is quite healthy. It's quite good for our brain. So if it if it hit all the wrong alpha synuclein, we could end up being worse off than if if we hadn't targeted at all. Which I guess must be a theoretical risk. I think it, it is a theoretical risk, and uh, it's a very low risk. Uh, if you uh, there are other strategies like uh, uh, decreasing the production of alpha synuclein. So just before everything starts, so you can try to, to decrease the uh, alpha synuclein uh, production by uh, different means. And uh, they have all, at least in the experimental work, they have been shown to be relatively safe. Uh, animals have been uh, genetically engineered in order not to express alpha synuclein. They do just fine. So uh, uh, they seem to be, I mean, they are extremely surprisingly not different from the uh, wild type uh, animals from the normal animals so right. in theory decreasing the load of alpha synuclein uh, as carries very little risk so 
having okay. antibodies uh, which are very bad or they, are, they do the job but uh, in terms of quantity they are relatively very bad at uh, decreasing large amounts of semiplane so therefore the risk is, uh, is minimal okay okay and and uh, so so if i've understood all this correctly and your work has obviously made a major contribution to this is that is that you know alpha spreads we're not quite sure by what route but it spreads by probably various routes or has the potential to it seems to cause pathology in specific sites almost regardless of where you put it in in some ways at least in the gut and and that targeting the, the species that causes that with an antibody might be might be a good way forward so i mean have you done experiments yourself to show whether you can stop pathology with with antibodies and and you know in the in the clinical field how far has that gone because i know there are trials that are ongoing with this approach which have as you said have shown it's quite safe but but i don't know if you have any views on how effective they've been or or not so far so there are uh, indeed uh, clinical trials uh, that are ongoing uh, for uh, immunization active or passive immunization against uh, alpha semiplane and uh, so they are ongoing so we don't know of course the, uh, we don't know mm. the outcome yet but uh, as you know the field of alzheimer's disease uh, has uh, produced a number of trials with, uh, with immunization and um, virtually all trials uh, for using immunization against a beta one of the uh, proteins that is highlighted in alzheimer's disease they have uh, been shown to be uh, to be negative and for tau we have to wait for for having uh, the outcome of, of more trials uh, when i said negative i think it is positive and negative it is negative for the patient ultimately meaning that the uh, immunization has shown that uh, uh, there is no improvement of the behavioral performance of the patient, of the cognitive performances. But it was positive in the way that, yes, the immunization was capable of removing the plaques. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first concept of using antibodies for removing aggregated proteins, a beta, tau, semiplane, whatever, <clears throat> it seems that, yes, antibodies can enter the brain. They can do the job for what they were uh, designed. Uh, however, we failed in uh, or first, when I say we, it's in the field, of course, I wasn't born for <laughs> elaborated the hypothesis, but uh, um, the initial hypothesis that by removing the plaques, they might improve the cognitive status of Alzheimer's patient was, uh, was wrong, but it was made uh, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. so it's easy to, uh, to say that they were wrong now, but uh, it was a uh, it was a very uh, insightful hypothesis, and uh, and the whole field of neurodegeneration uh, should be thankful that they have tried to, to do so because now we are we are trying to refine this approach. But mm. basically, the concept has been elaborated 25 years ago. So, I mean, that's a very important point, isn't it? That the, the, the that the antibody therapies in Alzheimer's disease to remove this protein amyloid have been very effective at removing amyloid. What they haven't been very effective at is treating people with Alzheimer's. And, and in Alzheimer's, there are two proteins, tau and amyloid. So, so then it may be another protein, it may be too late in the disease process. So you're right that if the trials fail in, out in Parkinson's disease, it may be because there's another protein we're not quite aware of, or it may be we've gone too late. So in terms of your own work, because you know we're into the last sort of few minutes now really, I mean, where do you see your work going now? So, so, so you've demonstrated quite elegantly in these non-human primate studies the spread of protein, uh, the spread of alpha synuclein. I think you've also used, or other people have used, Lewy body extracts to show that this, that you know, the Lewy body, which is as we discussed, is alpha synuclein plus other proteins, has similar properties. You've demonstrated that it can spread in this way. So, I mean. Where do you see the, where do you see your work going now, and and how will that impact on people on this call or listening to this, uh, you know, recording, in terms of how this will help therapeutically? Do we just have to wait for these synuclein uh, antibody trials to know whether this is going anywhere, or, or or what would be where will you see your work going to help people with this condition? Well, we have to wait for the outcome of these uh, of these trials, but uh, there are many many consequences of of our work and. Uh, the team is pretty large. I mean, we are 25, so therefore we are uh, exploring uh, different venues. But in terms of uh, therapeutic outcome, clearly for us, development of such a non-human primate model is a perfect test bench for 
new therapeutics. And uh, also, uh, we, uh, we, we like, of course, uh, the work around the passive and active immunization. In the team, we pursue other avenues or possibilities, looking at uh, strategies for increasing the degradation of aggregates by trying to boost the uh, catabolic uh, capabilities of uh, surviving uh, neurons uh, by trying also uh, uh, to decrease the expression of alpha cyclin by uh, different means. So we do not simply say that uh, the only hope is uh, through uh, immunization. It could also be either alone or in combination uh, through uh, uh, other means such as uh, improving the Metabolism of uh, alpha cyclin. So, so that's a very important point. That you, that you now have a model. So, one of the problems in Parkinson's disease has been we don't have a very good model. So, if we want to slow, show we can slow down the disease in a model, we don't have anything where we can have confidence in that. And a lot of therapies which have translated to the clinic have failed. There may be reasons for that, but one of them may be that the models are not very good. We've tested it on, so so your model is a very faithful reproduction of Parkinson's disease and and and. Uh, it, pathologically uh, so that's so obviously we can now test all these drugs so uh you know in the last uh, spotlight we we're talking about you know drug repurposing looking for other drugs around which which might be available to slow down disease which we could get to clinic quickly and your model would be a perfect way by which to do that and and i i, I would be more cushion it's <laughs> it's, one, it's one model of uh of alpha semiglin pathology uh, okay would even call it a model of Parkinson's disease because Parkinson's disease is far more complex, but uh, it's a perfect, uh, I think it's a very good model of, uh, of alpha semiglopathy and yeah. impossible spreading of, uh, of a species of alpha semiglopathy, we don't know which one, uh, but are contained into the, uh, into the memory body. And in that respect, yes, it's a very good model for testing strategies aiming at, uh, at preventing the development of such pathologies that we all believe, the whole field believe, at the source uh, as a cause of uh, Parkinson's disease. Okay, so so one of the questions which uh, Bob has put into to the chat is, you know, how much do you work with other groups? So obviously there are lots of groups working on alpha synuclein. You mentioned Virginia Lee and such like. So, I mean, this is often a question we get asked in the research community by the patient carer community. I mean, how much do we collaborate with each other? Or are we all doing exactly the same experiments in different? places but but it, i thought it'd be useful because you work in a very specialized area because non-humane primate work is not done in many places uh, and it's not done to the standard that you do which is very impressive so so how much do you work with other groups around this sort of alpha synuclein hypothesis and modeling everyone is working in a, as a network these days it's impossible to conduct such studies uh, by doing everything yourself uh, to take the example of the two uh, Big studies uh, that we are discussing uh, tonight, uh, done in, uh, in in monkeys. So uh, of course uh, we were the uh, we were the leading group. But uh, when you if you look at the authorship of the papers, we were 30, 33 uh, authors, meaning that uh, a number of teams have been involved into uh, into this uh, <laughs> into this work. Uh, Miguel Villar was uh, one of the team uh, because of his uh, expertise in cell death and disease. Jose Opezo from, uh, from Madrid uh, as the uh, clinical uh, referent of the, uh, of the team, uh, Pascal Derkinderen in North in France, uh, because he has a very specific expertise on the study of the arteric nervous system. And basically, I have no idea how to, how to process uh, those tissues, but uh, they clearly have the expertise. Brit Molenauer in Germany, because she is uh, one of the world uh, leading uh, expert for the development of biomarkers in Parkinson's disease. Omar Elagnaf in Doha in Qatar because he has developed specific antibodies specific of uh, certain forms of alpha sweeping and so on. So basically when you develop such very large scale project, you have to be uh, surrounded by colleagues who are experts in certain parts. You do not want to reinvent the wheel. You really have to benefit from the expertise of others. Okay. So that, I mean, that's a great, a great answer that it's international and it's expertise and they're people from the clinical and the non-clinical field who are working together to, to, to solve this, this, this problem. So, I mean, in the last minute or two, I, I suppose 
there was one point you made at the end, which I thought was a very interesting point about therapeutic approaches to Parkinson's disease, which is, you know, as you all know, we all go to meetings and people stand up and tell you the problem with Parkinson's disease is a mitochondria and they sit down, the next person stands up and says it's a problem with the lysosome and they sit down. So everyone has their own favourite part of the system and they all think the answer lies in that one system, whereas it could be much more of a problem across different areas. So I suppose I just, in closing, I'd just like your sort of views on, on do you think combination therapy is the way we should be going? So you were talking a little bit about knocking down alpha-synuclein, so you can use these things so like anti-sense, oligonuclein. So, so you could treat people to produce less alpha-synuclein. You could then give them a vaccine to kill off bits of alpha-synuclein that are spreading. And then you can give them drugs, which make sure that the trash is cleared more efficiently. So you produce slightly less, you stop it spreading, and you get rid of it more efficiently. And that combination treatment is actually the future in much the same way as people now treat heart failure or HIV infections or any infections, actually. So in the last minute or so, I'd just be interested in your views as to whether you think that's the way we should be going. And you know, is that something you can e easily explore in your model? Uh, absolutely. I mean, this is clearly uh, the dream of uh, of using multiple uh, therapies, a combination of uh, of therapies to increase the likelihood of uh, having a, a clinically relevant uh, effect. But I, I would say that uh, as a basic scientist, I would love it, and I, uh, it's relatively easy to explore the combination of uh, or the effect of uh, combination therapies in all models, but when you come into the, to the clinic, then uh, you are in trouble because uh, uh, studying uh, the effect of, uh, of uh, one approach is already problematic, but if you want to combine or to study the, uh, the combination of different therapies, you also have to study the effect of uh, the single approaches. So not necessarily in terms of, uh, of, let's say of, uh, of proof of efficacy clinical trial, but in terms of safety, then you need to increase the number of groups, the number of investigation. I mean, the payload for developing combination therapies is extremely, is, is huge. And conceptually, it is extremely tantalizing, but from a practical point of view, uh, the regulatory agencies are not ready for accepting uh, us to use a combination therapy. Yeah. Well, I guess if we can repurpose drugs that are already there, it, it, it would make it it'd make it a bit easier. So I think that brings us to the end of a, a fascinating hour. Thank you, uh, all three of you, very much for for sharing your uh, time with us. Uh, you know, explaining the work you do, which uh, has been transformative in in how we're understanding Parkinson's, not only in terms of what goes wrong, but therapeutically. So thank you all very much. Thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon, this evening, this morning, wherever you are. Uh, uh, for this. The next one of these will be on the 22nd of June, uh, when we will be picking up with Caroline Williams-Gray and her team in Cambridge, actually in the office next door to where I work, uh, on inflammation in Parkinson's, another very uh, major area which people are very interested in in Parkinson's. So thank you all very much. I don't know, Eli, whether there was anything else that we wanted. Uh, if not, I will say goodbye to everybody. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.